Well, so far we've talked about the first two Left Behind movies, and arguably the worst Left Behind movie, the Nicolas Cage one. But now let's talk about the one that I honestly always forget exists. Left Behind 3, World at War. Now, Left Behind 3, World at War came out in 2005 and is probably the most made-for-TV feeling of all of these Left Behind movies. Now, all these Left Behind movies don't have big budgets. It was an independent Christian production company that made these. They didn't have a lot of resources, but they did the best with what they had. They worked within their means, but for some reason, Left Behind 3 just feels like this other Left Behind movie that they just kind of put out. They didn't put a lot of time or effort in it. And in Left Behind 3, everybody's back. All our main characters, you know, Ray, Chloe, Buck Williams, Nikolai, they're all back. But now we have a new character, the President of the United States, played by Louis Gossett Jr. And he's more or less our main character throughout this movie, which is kind of a weird turn because the Left Behind movies so far haven't focused so much on the details of the geopolitics. It's always been happening in the background whenever you see Nikolai doing some shady dealings. You'll get a piece of that. But really these movies have followed the adventures of Buck Williams and Ray Steele. It's been a more personal and character driven narrative than a big world ending event narrative. But with this movie it feels a little backwards because a lot of the political stuff is front and center and stuff with Buck and Ray and Reverend Barnes all feels kind of in the background like that's the B plot and I kind of wish they didn't do this because it forces me to actually ask some tough questions about the world building because for the most part in the first two movies the world building has been consistent enough you know it's kind of the future but not so far into the future where you can't recognize things and institutions that still exist like the UN like America but since we're spending a lot of our time with the president and Nikolai and this conspiracy about bioweapons that supposedly Nikolai has it does force us to ask a lot more questions like okay what was the president doing during the build-up when Nikolai was just consolidating all this power during the first two movies and the movie never really answers this but it seems like the president has some regrets that maybe he shouldn't have given away that much power to the UN that maybe all the other countries that signed right away were mistaken and he's kind of grappling with that and that's all well and good on a character level but on a world building level everything just feels kind of half-baked like there's this underground militia that's at work that's not affiliated with the Christians but they also aren't believing in everything Nikolai is selling they're like okay this is becoming kind of fascistic we got to fight against this and the president has sympathies with that and there's this underground coalition where I guess other world leaders are secretly involved with and they have these secret group zoom meetings where they're plotting to overthrow Nikolai and take care of this bioweapon threat and honestly the way I'm explaining it is giving it too much credibility because I'm just here trying to piece together bits and pieces that we get kind of scattered throughout the movie to try to make some sense of the politics of the world and it's never really explained and with the title world at war you're expecting okay some big global catastrophe the world war three is about to break out and a lot of people are mentioning the possibility of world war three and what are we gonna do but we never really see that and we never really see a lot of the gears and mechanisms that are leading us to World War III. But then we have the whole thing with the bioweapon itself. And the bioweapon is probably the most interesting part of this movie, I would say. And it comes from this idea that in the last days, when all the judgments are coming, it's going to be wave after wave of disaster. And these disasters are actually going to echo the ten plagues from Exodus. So, you know, you're going to get flies, you're going to get locusts, you're going to get pestilence. And the pestilence is just a sickness. It's a disease. It's a virus that comes out of nowhere and just wipes out a huge portion of the population. It is a little scary that this movie came out in 2005 and in 2019 we had a pandemic of what may be a similar magnitude and that's a little creepy but in this movie Nikolai creates this bioweapon through his demonic powers. It's never really explained what this bioweapon is. It's these green vials of toxic gas or whatever. It honestly looks like the green goblin gas from the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. It's just that kind of cartoonish evil green mist that you know is just going to kill everybody and for a lot of this movie you're not really sure what Nikolai's intentions are and then all of a sudden you start seeing a lot of Christians starting to get sick seemingly at random at the church that all of our main characters attend and even Reverend Barnes starts getting sick and there's no cure nothing seems to be fixing it and this is one of the two really cool and creative interpretations of Revelation that this movie brings to the table that's actually fresh that we didn't see in the other two movies and the first is that there's this un 
underground Bible smuggling organization going on that our main characters are a part of, and they're helping to get Bibles into the hands of the newly converted Christians that are living in these end times. And since the world is under the thumb of the Antichrist, I can imagine Bibles are kind of hard to come by. So now we have these fugitive Christians trying to get Bibles to as many people as possible. That's honestly a pretty cool idea. But the second cool idea is that the twist in this movie is that the pestilence is coming from the Bibles, that Nikolai knew about this underground Bible smuggling thing and he is poisoning these Bibles so that whenever someone touches these Bibles, they start getting sick. And I love this for two reasons. One, it actually makes the Christians in these movies feel like fugitives. They are a class of people that are being persecuted and hunted by Nikolai Carpathia. And even though you don't actually see the persecution firsthand, you don't see anybody get decapitated in these movies, which again, I think is kind of a missed opportunity because the Bible specifically says if you don't take on the Mark of the Beast, you're done. But you do still feel it in the way the characters are interacting and just the underground nature. Compared to the last two movies where the Christians were still fairly public, where they were meeting in the church, they had services, they weren't really underground yet. But here they are and that's a pretty cool concept. But this is also great for the character of Nikolai. Now Nikolai has just kind of been a cartoonishly evil bad guy throughout really all of these movies. He doesn't really strike me as the type of antichrist that could persuade an entire world of people to follow him because he's got this very thick Russian or Eastern European accent that just screams bad guy. And I mean, just look at him. He just looks like this schemer, weaselly guy that nobody would ever trust. So it is kind of far-fetched to see how he would rise to prominence and take up this power, but what he does excel at is being that evil, threatening presence in the eyes of the Christian. So whenever a Christian looks at him, you can just tell this dude is bad news, he's got powers, and you don't want to get too close. But now knowing that he always knew about the underground Bible smuggling just makes him feel so much more of a threat. Because once we thought the Christians were one step ahead of Nikolai, Nikolai has still always been one step ahead of the Christians. But now let's talk about the stuff that doesn't work so well. And I already kind of talked about the inconsistent world building, the fact that it just feels kind of half-baked and yeah, when you start getting into the politics of it, it doesn't really work if you start thinking critically about how these governments operate and it just doesn't quite fit. But after our main characters find out what the source of this pestilence is and it's the Bibles and now they know, okay, stop the spread. They still have to find out a way to heal all these sick people and it's here where we get probably the cringiest scene in all of these Left Behind movies that I've seen so far. And already to enjoy these movies, you gotta put up with a few cheesy moments and a few cheesy bits of writing where people quote scripture, and you gotta kinda already be on board with that to really get a lot out of these movies. But here, I'm sorry, it just crossed a line that I wasn't ready for this movie to cross. And it's when Pastor Barnes is literally on his deathbed, and before he dies, he wants to do communion. And he does communion with Chloe, she's sick too, and they do it and they both drink the wine. And Chloe drinks the wine and she's healed. But unfortunately, Pastor Barnes does the same thing and isn't healed. He actually does die. I'm pretty sure he still dies. It's honestly a little fuzzy. I just watched this movie and I'm already starting to forget bits and pieces. That's just kind of how unimpressive and kind of forgettable and again it's got that made for tv vibe it's just kind of in one ear and out the other i'm pretty sure pastor barnes dies but chloe gets healed by the magical curative properties of communion wine and i was ready to accept that you have to do communion and that'll take care of your ailments but then buck williams gets on the phone and he's spreading the word that oh it's the wine everyone we gotta order some more wine we gotta get these people drinking wine because wine is the cure no either buck williams just got the wrong idea that regular red wine can cure this ailment or the writers really didn't understand the powerful scene that they just had and just thought oh yeah red wine because it's Christian affiliated. Now if I were writing this scene, I would do it where no, you have to do communion, you have to bless the wine, you have to bless the bread, and that combination with the prayer, with the scripture being referenced, that will cure the pestilence. And I thought that's where they were going, but then it turns out, no, it's just red wine. Any red wine will do. We just gotta start shipping it out to all the Christians we know. They just drink the wine and they'll be fine. Except again, I don't think it quite works because Pastor Barnes did still die after that. So I guess it's not completely foolproof unless I'm just misremembering it and let me know in the comments if I am because I feel like there was a reason why Pastor Barnes died 
And for the life of me, I can't remember it. I just remembered that he died and Chloe lived and then Buck Williams started telling everyone it's red wine. And that really is the cringiest and cheesiest part of this whole franchise for me. Because they had something actually very subtle and powerful and then they just kind of watered it down for everybody else. Oh, and then the movie ends with a big explosion because after the president actually converts to Christianity and that's honestly handled in an okay way. As far as the conversion scenes that we've got in this franchise, it's lower on the ranking of best conversion scenes that we have, but still not horrible, it's fairly believable. And once he converts, he goes and confronts Nikolai, and he is there to basically murder Nikolai. He's gonna put an end to him. Nikolai, with his Antichrist powers, turns the table on him where the bullets just go right through him, and he shoots the guard behind him, so now he looks like a murderer. Nikolai pushes him out of the window, and he somehow survives that by the grace of God, and it is played off as a miraculous save, but honestly, he should have died there. Even though they wanted to do this whole miraculous thing that really makes Nikolai nervous, like, oh, the power of God is in him. I feel like they could have done that in a different way and have the president just be a casualty of Nikolai's reign. That now, oh, the US isn't a president anymore. It actually doesn't have a vice president either, so I guess the Speaker of the House, whoever that is and maybe the speaker of the house is incredibly loyal to Nikolai so that'll kind of consolidate even more power for Nikolai but no they wanted to keep him alive so that he could do this voiceover about how the world's gone to crap and it's all his fault but while Nikolai is still up in the high rise there's a missile going right to his face and it blows up and you assume the Antichrist is dead no you see him walk out of the fire like the Terminator and that is actually fairly biblical it does say that there will be some kind of assassination attempt on the Antichrist and that it'll deform him or disfigure him in some way that it'll actually generate more sympathy for him during the next few years. But we don't see any kind of scarring or disfigurement that he can use to milk some sympathy. You just see him walking out like the Terminator, specifically the T-1000 where there's no mark on him. He looks perfectly fine. I don't know, I would have liked to see him with like a nasty scar or some blood or something. But that's just me. And that's really all my thoughts on Left Behind 3. I don't really have that much to say on it. It's just kind of in one ear, out the other. There's nothing that offensive or horrible in it. It's just kind of standard apocalyptic fare. And while we still have all the same cast members, actually aside from Pastor Barnes who got recast in between movies, not really sure why. But even with all these return characters and the little bit of character development that we do get with all of them, it, the script itself really doesn't do a lot with them and their personalities that we've come to enjoy don't really come through all that much because again, this is primarily focused on the president and his issues and his conversion and the plot surrounding the assassination of Nikolai and all this stuff that our main characters really do get kind of lost in the shuffle and the script just doesn't have that much to do with them. But now I turn it over to you guys. Have you seen Left Behind 3? I feel like this is kind of the forgotten one, the one that most people don't really watch or talk about. I honestly don't even know if this got a theatrical release. The first time I ever saw it, it was broadcast on TBN, the Christian cable network. So this may very well just be a made for TV Left Behind movie. But whatever you think, let me know in the comments. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. And as always, I'm Colby, this is Minority Talk, and I'll see you in the next video.